Well, I'm preaching on a sermon today. I mean, you're going to be like, man, you should preach like Peter. It's like five-minute sermon. Well, I'm not that good. And by the way, he preached more than just this. It says these are just some of the words, the sermon that the Apostle Peter preached at Pentecost when this great and amazing miraculous thing happened upon the early disciples of Jesus. Jesus ascended into heaven, sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And he sends his spirit, pours out his spirit upon his disciples. And some really trippy, weird things happen. They start speaking in languages they've never learned before. And people can actually understand what they're saying. And the message these people hear is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And Peter summarizes here in this sermon of Pentecost that we're going to look at today. You turn with me to the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 2. I'm going to start today. We're going to go all the way to 41. I'm just going to read from 14 to 35, and bear with me. I am going to preach in addition to this. Someone said, well, hey, you could just, you could just read his sermon. That counts. I do want to trust God to teach us, reveal his truth to us by his Spirit. It's been good to keep in mind why this book of Acts is written, written by the Apostle Luke. I'm sorry, Luke, the physician, spent a lot of time with the apostles, was one of Paul's companions, we see in some of his, his later books that Paul wrote. In the book of Acts, it goes from the third person to the first person, because in those accounts of Acts, that means that Luke, the physician, was with the apostle Paul during those things that are taking place in the latter part of Acts. And he's writing to Likely, former Gentiles like himself, those who were not Jewish, but who eventually came to embrace the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. And he's writing to them, explaining to them why it is not weird for so many of the, the Jews of Judaism to have rejected the Messiah, Jesus, who he is claiming as Jesus, who he believes is Jesus. And it doesn't mean that this is some new religion, this isn't some new novel religion that shouldn't be trusted because they just kind of have kind of gone off script. Luke is explaining that actually Christians are staying on script from what is in the Old Testament. And that Jews should not be weirded out either that all these Gentiles and these pagans are coming into the church and coming to trust in Jesus because that's exactly what God promised he was going to do through them as his people. And to actually be encouraged that Jesus truly is the king. King David is no longer the king. And Caesar, the Roman emperor, is also not ultimately the king. But Jesus is the king, the ultimate king, the Lord and Christ of Jew and Gentile, of all peoples of the earth, this Jesus whom we come to worship and to trust in and to believe and to receive from this morning. Jesus reigns as king. He's not the king who died. Jesus Christ is the king who lives. And his Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. And is at work now and in this sermon to speak to his people and to bring God's grace to us. So let's come now to this sermon. In Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 14. As Peter begins to explain what's happening with these tongues. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. 
But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes. The great and magnificent day shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me. For he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and the tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. And you will make full the gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of the descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up. And of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucify. Here ends the reading of God's word for the people of God. Let us all say together, praise be to God. Let us pray. God in heaven, thank you for your word to us. Thank you for this this sermon that I'm about to preach. But Lord, thank you for this sermon that the Apostle Peter preached at Pentecost, explaining what was happening with these tongues of fire that had shown up. Lord, will you please help us understand here today? Will you, by your Spirit, be at work in us to take away any blindness, any deafness, any incomprehension or or hardness of heart that would keep us from understanding? And reveal your Son, Jesus, to us. Help us to see him. And by your spirit, would you work powerfully to help us to love him with all our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 23.7 million household members watched, or households watched the royal wedding of Harry, Prince of England, and Meghan Markle. 1.9 billion people Watch this wedding. Do you remember it in 2018? Maybe you watched it. There's this weird fascination, even in America, with British royalty, isn't there? There's a TV show called The Crown, I think it is, on Netflix. Um, Harry and Meghan. Many of you know had a little falling out. The rest of the royal family. With the new king, King Charles, Harry's dad. And they got exiled to California, poor people. 
live with the peasants there? Why are Americans, why are we as Americans so fascinated with the royalty of Britain? Kristen Menzinger, a co-host of Newsweek's uh, The Royal Report podcast, said this commentary back in 2018 of just, it's crazy how many people watch this wedding, this British wedding. Says, I frequently refer to the British royal family as the longest running reality show on the planet. It's been a thousand years of marriages, divorces, beheadings, affairs. We kick them out of here, thinking about us as Americans, and proudly so. But like a lot of people, we break up, but sometimes we still want to keep an eye on what they're up to. Man, it's just interesting. Fascination with British royalty, because as Americans, there is no king to tread on us, Right? No king. We are free. We have freedom from the tyranny of King George when the revolution happened. From the English Parliament when the revolutionary war happened. So why are we so in love with this idea of royalty? Well, maybe it's because we don't live under it. We don't have to live under it as subjects of the British monarchy anymore, and so it just leaves us to be entertained by it. Why should any of us ever want to be subjects of anyone, let alone a man of Nazareth who died, who rose again, in Israel, named Jesus? Why should we give up all our freedom? Whatever we want to do, whatever we want to be, however we want to be, and whenever we want to be it, why would any of us want to bow down to a king? Why would any of us want to bow down to a king, Jesus? Why should we want to bow down to any other king other than ourselves? Isn't that what we all want? To be our own king. Like Simba the lion. Just can't wait to be king. Not all of our dream. Peter in this sermon of Pentecost is addressing the elephant in the room that's happening in Jerusalem during the festival of Pentecost, this Jewish festival. People are wondering, what is going on with these disciples of Jesus? What are they up to? What to make of these tongues? One conclusion is, well, they must be drinking. It says in verse 13, others mockingly said they are filled with new wine. And that word new is really, really important, actually. It's really, really important for what we believe as Christians. There is something profoundly new happening here. Incredibly new that's taking place here. But it's not wine, not alcohol, not drunkenness. It's the Spirit of God dwelling and filling the people of God like never before. And the reality of what we call the new covenant, promised through the prophet Joel and through prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel, this new reality of how God is going to reign and be at work in His people by the power of His Spirit. This is new. What Peter is trying to explain is why this is new, why this is happening, what is going on, and it's not what they think it is. It's something much greater in reality than that. Jesus is a king greater than David, is what Peter is arguing, and that's why this is happening. The Spirit has come and dwelled in God's people and forever changed our relationship with God as his people because Jesus is the greater king than David. You might expect after this tongues of fire and this coming of the Holy Spirit that the Apostle Peter is going to preach about the Holy Spirit. Tell us about the Holy Spirit. Tell us about that. But that's not what he does. What does he do? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus as king. Because King Jesus has done something and has kept a promise of God and fulfilled a promise of God that he made to King David, the Jewish king, Israel's king, longer before the emphasis of this sermon is that Jesus is a king greater than David. And we need this king, all of us. All of us need this 
king who can give us something greater than David ever could give to the people of Israel. We need this king, Jesus, who's greater than King David, to give us something, to accomplish something for us that David, as great as a king as he was, never could accomplish for Israel and never could give to us. The Holy Spirit is a new administration of God's grace. Jesus is the greater king than David. What does that mean? It means he's the greater servant than David. This prophecy of Joel here comes to God's people originally. Joel wrote it hundreds of years before Jesus came and was born of Virgin Mary. And it was really this, these words that came as kind of an interruption to really a, a prophecy of judgment for God's people. Locusts are going to come and start eating everything is what comes before this. <laughs> that just sounds terrible, doesn't it? Locusts coming into the earth and eating everything up and destroying everything and destroying the land. It's a common theme and thing we see. But the promise that Joel talks about and he brings up here is that though that's going to happen, I, I offer you comfort, a word of comfort that's going to come. That someone is going to be sent to you, a counselor, a comforter. The Spirit is going to be poured upon you, upon, upon all of my people and upon all flesh, not just Jewish people, but all peoples of the earth, which is what's happening at Pentecost, right? They're, they're preaching in tongues and all these different languages. All these people gathered together in Jerusalem for this festival from all over the world. And they're coming to understand and hear the good news of what God has done through a greater king than David, Jesus. But at the very beginning of verse 17, it's interesting, is, is really what, what Peter does in this sermon is he cites three different places of the Old Testament. And this first is Joel 2, uh, verses 28 to 32. But if you looked in your Bibles and went to Joel 2, verse 28, it wouldn't start like Peter does. He changes it just a little bit, explaining it. And what Peter starts is he's citing this verse from Joel 2 as he starts it with, and in the last days it shall be, God declares. And in Joel, in his prophecy, it starts something different than that. It says, it shall come to pass. So, so why does Peter stress, and he's teaching, right? He's preaching, and he's teaching what is being talked about there is that these last days. What he's saying is, Jesus, the greater king, is the greater servant. He's going to come and he's going to finish what King David couldn't finish. He's saying that Jesus, the greater king than David, has come to inaugurate and bring in the end days, the, the last days. We're into the final level of Mario. We are into the final stage of the play. We are into the, to the final stage of redemptive history when King Jesus comes. And he's going to finish the story. And he's going to finish the redemption that God has begun. And the Spirit coming upon all flesh and revealing Jesus as the King to all peoples of the earth is what God's going to do. He's going to bring the gospel and the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth. And then the end will come. And then the judgment will come. And it's not too late for any of us here, Peter says, and for any of you to now take this opportunity to come to faith in God and to turn from your sin and come to faith in this King Jesus. It's not too late for you. And know that he's going to come and he's going to finish it. I found this story about this guy named Ray Caldwell, an MLB pitcher back in the early 1900s. I think it was 1909 or 1919. On August 24th, he was a pitcher for the Cleveland Indians, pitched through eight innings. He only gave up four hits and a walk. And then as the eighth inning is, is closed and we're coming up to the final inning of the game, this incredible game that he has pitched, these rain claw, clouds start rolling through. And it's a thunderstorm. This is before the weather channel is a thing, right? And so they start to hurry up. It's like, we've got to get this game completed. I want to complete my game. And so they start they start playing the inning, the last inning of the game, and he's pitching to complete this game, and all of a sudden there's a crack of lightning, and it's scary. 
It was a little too close, everybody thought, more close than they thought. Everybody in the field around, all eight of the, the players in the field are all okay, they're all fine, but they look at the pitcher mound, and Ray Caldwell is knocked out flat, unconscious. He's been struck by lightning. Some of the players go to wake him up, and one of them gets zapped. Apparently that's a thing, I don't know. Gets zapped from this guy who's just been struck by lightning. Eventually he starts to move and to groan, and he stands up, and he says this. He says, I have one more out to get. Give me the danged ball and turn me toward the plate. This is in 1919. And he finished the game. And he got a ground out. The game was won. And he finished the game. It was finished. Something miraculous, something incredible, something that everybody would have thought, well, man, this, this King Jesus, he died. It's over. Well, this King Jesus rose from the dead, and he lives, and he reigns. And he's going to finish the game. And he's going to finish it, and it's not too late. The spirit that is poured out is of God's patience, of his great patience, of this greater servant, King Jesus, a greater king than David giving a chance, a final chance to all the peoples of the earth to repent and come to himself and come to faith in him. Jesus is the greater servant than David who will finish it. Peter is pointing out. And Jesus is the greater ruler than David who has come to reign and rule in a greater way than David ever could. And he's reigning right now is Peter's second point. And what he quotes in this second passage in Psalm 16, 8 through 11, is a, is a kingly passage about David. And these are words from King David that he says, starting in verse 25. He says, and he says in verse 23, I'm sorry, Peter says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. The point is he's making is like, listen, this. This crucifixion of Jesus wasn't, wasn't an accident. And what God is doing here at Pentecost isn't simply a reaction. What, what, what God did through the resurrection wasn't, wasn't merely a reaction to Jesus, this king, dying. It was always part of the plan. It was always what God set out to do. He sent Jesus to come to inaugurate this new kingdom of God. And he sent him to die on the cross and to rise from the dead so that he could do something that David, King David, could never do because King David died, didn't he? But King David remained dead, Peter says. Brother, I say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried in verse 29 and his tomb is with us to this day. You can go see it. You can go see it. That's a historical reality about King David. He lived and he died and he was buried. But there's a greater historical, as historical reality of King Jesus. Jesus came, he lived, he died, he was buried, and he rose from the dead and showed up to 500 something people who can all give attestation to him, including Peter and the other apostles and the 120 at Jerusalem at Pentecost. And they all saw it. I was there. Peter's saying. And so were some of you. You saw him put to death. You saw him buried. And these tongues of fire have come out. This incredible miracle that has taken place because he truly lives and reigns on high. He still reigns. And he still rules. And he has given a gift of his spirit to his people. So that you can hear the good news for yourself that you can be saved from your sin if you come to faith and trust in him. Verse 32, this Jesus God raised up. And of that, we are all witnesses. Jesus is the greater king than David because David does not reign right now. His reign ended with his death. Well, before that, actually. But Jesus' reign continues because he rose from the dead, so that God could keep this covenant promise. And this covenant promise is the Davidic covenant. 
got all these covenants. You've got the, Sin- you've got the Abrahamic covenant. You've got the Sinai covenant with Moses. You've got the Davidic covenant. And then the prophet Jeremiah and Joel is talking about this new covenant reality. What is this new covenant? It's the fulfillment of all of those covenants. It's the fulfillment of all of those promises. And this was the promise that God made to David, the one who died and remained buried. He said this, but my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. Verse 16, it says, and your house, David, and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever And David, like a prophet, likewise is saying, listen, my throne is going to remain forever. And now David knew he was going to die and he was going to be buried. He knew that. So what is he doing? Even David knew that there was one to come after him, his son, who would die but who would rise never to die again. And he would reign even though he suffered Because this is the truth. Jesus is a ruler greater than David who continues to reign. And he has delivered us with a deliverance that is greater than David could ever have accomplished. In verses 32 through 35, it says that Jesus God raised up. David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. It says, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. There are no more enemies for Jesus to defeat. King David had to defeat the Philistines, didn't he? He had to defeat the Amorites and the Amalekites and others. Is there any more enemies for Jesus to defeat as king, to deliver us from? No, he's delivered us from our sin. He's delivered us from the evil one, Satan, who tempts us to despair and seeks to take us away from Jesus. And he has defeated us even from death. Oh, death, where is your sting? Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 15. Final enemy has been defeated. And he's been defeated at the cross. And it's the resurrection of King David the greater king than David, Jesus, when he rose from the dead, that proves that what he accomplished at the cross really was accomplished for us. And our sins really are forgiven because he couldn't remain under the corruption of death. If Jesus was just a sinner like David and he was buried, he would remain buried under the power of death But Jesus couldn't be remaining under the power of death because he rose because he's not a sinner. But he made a perfect sacrifice for our sins upon the cross when he died for us. And he has conquered all of his and our enemies and forever. Psalm 110 is one of the most cited verses of the Old Testament. And David is saying, The Lord said to my Lord, to my superior, to my son, until I make your enemies your footstool. David understand there was one greater coming after him, and that was Jesus. As we come to the last part of this sermon, I want to get back to the British royalty for a second. Harry and Meghan, I don't know if you've been following, but they have departed from the rest of the royal family. It's not been very good for them. There's a big fight between them. Harry and Meghan Markle have made some decisions. They, they abdicated from the royal family, from their responsibilities and their titles. They moved to California. I don't know why. And they have lost the titles and replaced informally with a title, really, of, of traitor to many of their people in England. That look at them as what they're doing is treasonous. Harry has written a, a memoir about his father slandering him, even if all the things he is saying are true, slandering the family in general. 
And what Jesus, what Peter says to these people that he's preaching to, and he's preaching about the gospel, and he's saying what happened to Jesus and Jesus' life. Did you catch that? He says, and you crucified him. This is your king. The king promised that would come after David. Your king, and you crucified him. You put him to death. You traitors. It's treasonous. And they know it. By the power of God's Spirit, as they're hearing this sermon, which I don't know, it's a good sermon. It's an okay sermon. It's better than my sermons, but it's not that great of a sermon. Really, what is it? It's a bunch of sermon texts that he's preaching from the Old Testament. He's just saying what they're saying. He says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. And they must be thinking, uh oh, we're traitors. It says, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And understandably, they asked the questions, what are we supposed to do now if we have killed our king? If we have crucified him on the cross? What's to come of us? What's to happen to us? I know what I would do to us if I was king. What are we supposed to do? How can we get out of this mess? Is there any hope for us as we have been a traitor to our king, Jesus? And they get these words, good news. that are good words and good news for all of us who would trust in Jesus, that we ourselves may be traitors, may be far off from God in rebellion against him. It says repent. Repent. Believe that Jesus came to die for rebels like you, for traitors like you. Whatever you've lost will be restored to you. The title you have lost, you can have that title back. And I will mark you as my people. I will mark you with the mark of baptism. You receive this baptism. Repent, believe the gospel, and receive this mark, this mark of baptism, that you belong to me, you traitors, because I came to die for you. And I came that your treason would be forgiven through trusting in my son, because my wrath was satisfied upon him for all that you have done and sin against me, even crucifying the king of glory. Galatians 3, 27, 29, which I read earlier for this morning's baptism. This is what baptism is. This is what baptism does. It's our initiation into this new covenant community of God's people and the reality of the new covenant and the bringing of the Holy Spirit the church that is greater than new people, than the Old Testament people of Israel. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, if you belong to him, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So here's the first step of discipleship. You believe, you trust in Jesus. You receive what he did for you by faith. And then you join the church. And you become a member of this covenant community. And these people that God has saved and transformed and is transforming and has brought in back to himself as far as they may have been. Leonard Vanderzee says, in his book, Christ, Baptism, and the Lord's Supper, he says, In baptism, we are now one community in Christ, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. Baptism not only creates a new identity for the individual Christian, but it places him or her into a community. And this new community of, bapti- of the baptized functions in a radically different way than any other human community before it. It's the church. I'm going to look more at what that church is to look like next week as we come to the end of this chapter of Acts. I encourage all of us to remember this. That in baptism, we receive a royal marking of belonging to the one people of God as members of his kingdom. It says, we do not need another David. We need a, da- a greater David. 
We need a king who can die for the traitor, welcome the stranger, can make the rebel clean. And that's the truth for all of us who would come to this king in repentance and faith. Not with good works, because you don't have enough of them. You never will. Not with some commitment that you'll never be a traitor again to him, because, I don't know, that would be true or not. But you come with your sin, you come with your treason, you lay it at the foot of Jesus. You receive his spirit by faith in him become a part of this community of broken people that are being healed and made new by his grace. Christ is the greater king. That brings us into a greater kingdom. Not a greater kingdom as in the old one was thrown out, but a, a better kingdom as one that has fulfilled all those other promises that were made to Abraham and made to Moses, made to David, and now made to us. Fulfilled promise, a kept promise that we have received as his covenant community. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your son who has given your spirit to us. We thank you that despite our treason, despite being traitors, despite being far off from you, that you have brought us near through his blood on the cross. Thank you for welcoming us. Thank you for welcoming us into your people. Thank you for loving us by your grace. Pray as we go out from this place that we would love and care for each other well and that we would love our neighbors well and that we would proclaim to them the glories of our great King Jesus who reigns and rules forevermore, that they would come to receive the same blessing of being in his kingdom as his servants, to know him and your love for us through him. We pray for this in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, let's stand, let's sing our final song today, which is for a thousand tongues.